up is uh, another one of the MOSPACs. Uh, Dennis has been around a long time. He's been in this industry. He's been associated with Alaska Energy uh, for the better part of 20 years. Um, is involved in a lot of systems configurations currently going on in the state. And I think he's going to talk about some uh, some new ideas that he's trying. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I may have a, I've had a cold, so I might have to cough here during the middle. So to ignore that. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of the, the story of the Chinook Wind Group and their Windy Heat Smart Grid. But there, I think there are a couple people out here that over time have made small, sometimes large, but they've made important contributions and they continue to make important contributions to pushing this whole to the progress of uh, renewables in Alaska. And uh, one is Peter Krimp. He's running the AEA program. I don't know if Peter's here or not, but he's constantly shoveling coal and taking the arrows for most of us around here. And uh, someone else who did some very important mo uh, wind resource assessment and, and, and got that program well on its feet is, is Mia Devine. She's there with GEC and she's done, she, Years ago, she was just in graduate school and she did some excellent work here. And I think that uh, uh, John uh, Mason and J.P. Pinard, a long time ago, there's been a great collaboration between, I think, a growing collaboration between Alaska and Canada. And John and J.P., when uh, no one even thought about when they were doing things like uh, self-erecting uh, 100 uh, 150 uh, kW bonus on the top of a Hakel Hill in in Whitehorse, and nobody nobody even thought that could be done without a crane. So, and 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 dealing with the icing issues, and that was 20 years ago, John, something like that. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 years ago. Uh -huh. So I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell a little story about the Chininik Wind Group and their smart grid. That's what we're working on. I think that's the pathway. I think that's where things are going. And uh, I think they're going to eventually get there. Uh, a little bit about the Chinook Wind Group. In 2005, a group of villages got together. Fuel prices were going up. And they said, hey, we want to put wind turbines in. It, w it, it came out of a conference, a rural energy conference we had in Valdez. And there they saw a, a, a remanufactured Vestas V15. And at that time, things like the Northwind 100 were just coming out. Uh, they're all about the same size. They're located in the lower Kuskokwim Delta. They have good wind regimes, uh, class six, class seven wind regimes. All the communities have sort of a similar population except Kipnuk. We have projects going on in, right now, construction in Kongiganak, Quigilingak, Tantutuyak. These projects will probably be online uh, by the end of June. Uh, just a little picture of what the community looks like. You guys can get oriented. They all kind of look the same. No trees. Uh, they got boardwalks. You fly in. Uh, they get barge access, uh, uh, sort of on an ad hoc basis, depending on. They at least get a fuel barge each year, but sometimes they don't get other uh, freight barges. Uh, but they all pretty much look the same. It's what they look like from the ground. Boardwalks, small houses. Uh, maybe 150, 250 houses in a residence. They all have diesel plants. And here's the group. And in in any of these projects, they've got this dynamic. And the dynamic is around what the community wants. And this community, they made it very clear. We want the maximum value for any money that we spend. Two, we want systems that our local guys can work on. And three, we want as many turbines as possible for the money because stuff breaks. They don't know when things are getting back. So we used remanufactured windmatic machines. They're 17 meter, very similar to what John showed with the Vestas machine. Uh, but I want to tell you, this is this, I'm going to give you my conclusion right now. This is sort of the summary of wind diesel. If uh, once a man indulges himself in murder, very soon he comes to think little of robbing, and from robbing he comes to think next to drinking and Sabbath breaking 
and then everything just kind of falls apart and you become incivil and they procrastinate. <laughs> so in 2005, we sort of joked that, oh, oil will never get to $100 a barrel, right? And then we heard things in, in you know, 2002, 2003, there'll never be wind here. And then sort of we, hear, we started hearing, well, a little might be okay. And then we heard, well, maybe we'll take a little more. And then it's more like, uh, maybe we need a different kind. You know, we, we need some with direct drive turbines. And, well, maybe we need to do something else with wind. And so this is kind of what happened with Chinini. We went out first thing and surveyed folks. What do you want? We talked to everybody. And they said, we try our best to keep, uh, keep up with costs of fuel and lights in order to have transportation for survival. Well, that was kind of curious. And then uh, Paul says, installing wind turbines will, get, uh, will be great because of high prices for stove oil. They're just too high. And so helping reduce energy bills with wind is what, we're, uh, what we need to keep our houses warm. So we surveyed the community. And what we found was about 25% of the fuel being used in the community was going to power generation. About 15% was going to transportation. And that transportation is, ma is mainly snow machines and outboards. And the rest was going to home heating. So 60% uh, was going to, ho to home heating. So if we were going to put wind systems in and solve the problem of making both uh, wind economical and solving individuals' problems of being able to afford energy, we needed to address the heat problem. So that meant we needed some way to get wind uh, to heat homes. So what we came up with was this wind village smart grid when we started thinking about it. So, you know, what Hito said before was like, Hito and I didn't talk about this before. All right. So, you know, you, we put in extra wind turbines because when you gear up to bring your crane in to install the foundations, and set up a wind turbine, well, you've paid all this cost to get the barge down there to haul everything in. So that's the time to put up one or two more wind turbines. Um, we didn't have a lot of wind turbines to pick from. We had remanufacturing machines, and we had the Northwind 100. I think the Northwind 100 is an excellent machine. I wish we'd used it. But uh, the troops wanted those machines that they could work on. And it's probably a good decision. Okay. Uh, uh, can I go back here just one second? How do you go back? Oh, there we go. OK, so here was the concept. OK, here's what we do. Put up extra wind turbines, and then we need to sell that wind into some device. And if we do that, then we got to meter it differently. And uh, so we start off with a concept, right? Our scheme was to take these thermal storage devices. They have bricks. They're just the box. And they have bricks down at the bottom here. And those bricks heat up to 1,200 degrees. And they store the heat when it's available. Now, they use these for off-peak heating in the Midwest, and there's lots of them. Uh, it's a simple, uh, robust storage medium. And, and so the idea was, OK, let's put in some extra wind turbines, and let's put these devices in the home. And when there's extra wind, all right, so how do you control these things? Well, we have a base station. And that base station broadcasts out to each one of those devices, each one of those thermal storage devices. And inside that device, uh, and then it, it has a two-way communication with that device, and it sends information back to the power plant so that you can know the status of the device, what its storage capability is, how much wind you can put into it, and it has to have a submeter in it so you can keep track of the energy that you, pro the wind energy that you provide to the device separately than you uh, uh, would if you were generating with diesel. The reason for that is 
the community gets a subsidy for electricity for their home. And these devices would exceed that uh, subsidy. And if we could put wind in and sell that wind for 50% of the cost of diesel fuel, now we've got the cost of the diesel fuel going to the local utility stand in the community. And the, com and the customer gets uh, a reduction in, in their heating costs. So, so we built this controller for that thing, okay? And it's uh, got a wireless signal, it's got a, a meter in it, and it's got a couple uh, devices in it. First of all, it's got a, an SSR so that we can send these devices a proportional signal. Let's say I've got, right now we only have say 20 devices or 30, 30 of these units in a community. And they're rated at between six and 10 kW. Uh, uh, that's the amount of energy that any, time, any one time we can put in. And the storage capacity uh, varies by the size of the box, but I think these have about, each one of these will have about, uh, about 110 BTUs of storage, but they also produce at the same time there's wind. So they have storage in them. That's about a gallon of fuel. It should keep your house warm for a day. Uh, we did survey all the houses to see about how, how big they were, tried to size this thing. But there's some, you know, some special changes that we needed to make to the controller so that we could adapt them to the system. One is the SSR so that we can send out a proportional signal uh, to say, you know, I've got 100 kilowatts and I distribute that across, uh, across my load uh, proportionally depending on how many units I have on. Also, it's got a, a low frequency uh, uh, cutoff relay so that if the bottom drops out, these things drop off. And that's set to about uh, what the droop setting on the diesel engine said. Uh, little transceivers mounted on the back. In this instance, it's a 900 megahertz system. It has a, both a, uh, a transmitting and receiving uh, radio. They talk on a mesh network back to the power plant. Okay, so now all of a sudden, we're into smart grids, okay? So I've got a smart grid controller and it talks to the wind turbines, and it talks to the diesel station, and it talks to uh, my, my, my boiler for uh, frequency control. And if in the future, uh, if I have batteries or flywheel or ultra capacitors, or whatever, it fits into that system. But then we find that we've got to have a, well, the next step would say, gee, you know, what if I really had a, a, a had automatic meter reading with this system so that I could read everything automatically. I didn't have to true up that uh, uh, true up my uh, thermal stoves uh, with a spreadsheet and so that I could run everything through the meter. So that's the next step. Everything's going to go through the meter. So when you there are several companies out there now who are professing to provide meters where you can broadcast to the meter and it will broadcast to a device in the home. So it's like, it's a tiered network. You have a, a wide area network and then you have a medium or mid-tier network and then you have a home network. And the meters are on the home network and you broadcast to the meter and that can actually do all your sub-metering and talk to the device. That's one of the architectures, but that comes with an automatic meter reading architecture. Okay, so now if you can mesh those two controls together, you're in, uh, you're, you're putting a Wi-Fi broadcast out in the community. Well, gee, once you're putting a Wi-Fi broadcast out in the community, the utility can now, you know, sort of give people information about what's going on. They can provide, uh, uh, cost information to people, individual customers. They can provide that information so that they can uh, control at their utility or make changes at their utility so they can uh, initiate control programs. Uh, they can integrate the wind. And then there are new opportunities. You're making a Wi-Fi broadcast out. Some of the systems come with special ways to partition that Wi-Fi broadcast so that now the utility can, if it has the backhaul bandwidth, also provide 
uh, internet access. So, you know, and with metering, on that Wi-Fi network are these uh, user interfaces. So I'm not saying that all the systems have this. We have, we are broadcasting and beginning to bring information back with the smart meter. These next tiers, they're built in. They are built into the system. So, you know, we started off, uh, you know, now, oh, I'm sorry. You have a community energy information system now, right? That, 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 that comes from the meters, from the SCADA information, and from your stoves. Okay, that's it. If you get a strong internet con connection, those things are software programs that are built in. So we had induction wind turbines. And you know, if they start right, if everything's right, if you catch the wind at the right time and connect to the grid properly, you know, some of the older turbines weren't well behaved on the grid. So we looked at how we would reduce transients, provide some VAR support, and expand our operational range. Well, over the last 10 years, the cost of power electronics has probably gone down by, well, we bought an inverter for, I think, Lime Village, and it was a 70 kVA inverter, and that was, what, 2003 or something. And that thing was like 100,000 uh, bucks. They have clean power drives now, which are IGBT-based inverter drives. Those are off the shelf. They're mass-produced. Those things uh, uh, provide become a, 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 can change these machines into variable speed controllers because they control very rapidly both the frequency and the voltage into the induction generator. So with special algorithms, you can provide a variable speed operation with this turbine. That makes it much better, much, much, uh, that expands your opportunities for controlling it on the grid. So, you know, we get unity power factor. It produces current. Uh, it doesn't consume VARs. And we can also, in, uh, at higher wind speeds, we can, we, can, we can set an upper limit on its output. So this, because of the problems that we're solving on the grid, we have this uh, for our turbines, and it'll be out... Uh, on our first turbine next month. For, it's on the test bed, comes off the test bed this next week and we, we'll be putting on a turbine next month. So I can answer more questions about how the variable speed works on an induction machine uh, two months from now. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is this, this wind diesel really is, I think it's leading the way to these solutions because we have to deal with these problems. So, you know, we started off with wind diesel. So we, we, I guess, you know, we got involved in murder. Uh, so, so where do I think it's going next? Well, uh, I think it's going to be bigger turbines, great big turbines. Not if we want to, if we're serious about reducing uh, uh, dependency on on fossil fuels, even in these small communities, we're going to have to figure out how to gear up to put some big machines in. Because if you look at the total energy that's going in there and you want to displace it, you got to have some real kilowatt hours. Uh, power electronics, that's going to bring it all together. Uh, and it's getting cheaper. Some kinds of energy storage, well, you know, we're, we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper into this. So energy storage, we've got thermal energy storage, but, you know, maybe it's, we got flywheels. we got uh, lithium-ion batteries. we got... Uh, ultra capacitors, those, all of those are going to be in the mix. Advanced metering, it's going to be part of it. We've got to separate things. Uh, training and job creation. Those are things that happen out of these projects because the community wanted that. It's part of the dynamics. We want to be able to take care of these ourselves. So instead of 
paying for diesel fuel going out. They want to pay to have local people work on those machines and capture some of that value. Business sustainability, that's, that's deeper in the mud. I mean, we've got to solve this business sustainability. These are small, isolated communities. There may not be enough economy of scale or capabilities there to really do the job that needs to be done. These, some of these metering and monitoring systems, they're web-based. People have to share that stuff. So it's going to be changing these business models. Uh, these utilities are, in, at least in smaller instances, are going to morph together. They're, they're not going to be so fragmented. Maybe the local electrical utility is going to share something with the water and sewer utility. Maybe we're going to make water. Maybe they're going to supply internet. Right? This bit about, you know, maybe we're going to generate a, a, a excess electricity and uh, heat greenhouses. Uh, where are the self-regulated grids going to come from? They're going to come from wind diesel systems. You know, you go to uh, USDOE and they're talking about, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, Russell has got this, uh, uh, you know, he's got this problem out here with the uh, PV systems. Well, why don't you turn those air conditioners off for when you have a problem, right? And why don't they turn off on their own? Just like these thermal storage devices. When the wind comes up, why don't they turn on? And all by themselves. Because, and, and you say, well, that stuff's crazy. Well, I don't think it's crazy. I think that these sorts of things that we're talking about and we're dealing with on a wind diesel system and, and, and we're starting to conquer those problems, those are going to be common, I think, in five and ten years. So... You know, you can call me crazy, but I think it's coming, okay? So anyway, I'm sorry about that. There's my contact uh, info if you want it. Thank you. Any so questions? We a few questions for Dennis. How fast can you turn the, the thermal storage units off? Right now... Because they're on a, a wireless controller, right? Well... Stage two wireless controller, we can go to uh, about one to two seconds. Right now, we're on. We're our target is four seconds uh, for this for these. All right. Good. Uh, how many of these devices per household, and is that their own resources, where it means of heating their home? No. What we did is we surveyed the households. And they're all different size, pretty small. Our target here, because of how much wind we have, um, we have those come in different sizes. Those are what we call room heaters. And uh, they're sized to, to keep a house of about 1,000 square feet warm if they keep the doors open to the other rooms. So it, it, you know, they provide, I think the units provide peak about 20,000 BTUs per hour. So you can put many around the homes, but in these communities, you've got to adjust the element sizes because the service panels just don't have the capacity to take the amperage. And then there's going to be all these issues of balancing these loads on the grids and designing the, the transformers and the distribution systems to make sure they take it. Uh, and so how far can you take the... How much wind can you actually put in a system? And, and how fast can you put it in? And where's it going to go? And how, how long does it last? That's a great, I mean, that's a problem. That's a modeling problem that we're going to solve here before, you know, somebody else gets it, I think. No, they usually use, they usually use wood, wood, wood heat, if they have it. And um, they have Toyo stoves, typically. They're just a... An oil heater. There, we're to displace that heat. Yeah, we're hoping in these places our our target is to get like a hundred to one hundred and fifty gallons per household saving, just because the way we're limited. Right now. <coughs> um, 
um, some of these communities I know before the wind was added, when the stronger winds would pick up, there would be a lot of those short blackouts and they'd lose power and that was a concern because a lot of people had to go <coughs> to the toil stoves that have electrical spinning. So when those blackouts would happen, though people were <coughs> losing their heating sources. So I wondered if there's been some more stability of that so that there is less of those power losses. Well, this is stored energy. So if there's an outage, you still have the heat in there. It, okay. But the next big thing is all the distribution systems are not. They're, they're sort of out of date and uh, poorly engineered and poorly constructed. So eventually the distribution systems are going to have to be upgraded, but most of the faults occur on the distribution systems. I, well, uh, the data would, I believe the data would support that. Yeah. Yeah, what kind of pricing arrangement are you uh, uh, having with uh, those uh, heat degradables, those heaters? Could you repeat that question? What kind of pricing arrangement do you have with the, each homeowner when they, when they receive the, the excess uh, power for their heaters? We are working on a business plan. Ginny, you can stand up. I think Ginny's helping us work on the, the business plan, rate structures for that, for, for, for that pricing. But the target is 50% of the cost of diesel fuel, equivalent cost of diesel fuel. You had uh, at one point planned on, on looking at electric vehicles, either four-wheelers or snow machines. Has that progressed anywhere? We would love to do that, we, and, and I think you know, you know some of that stuff's going to get there, but we're, we're going to work through those problems and with this and and start tackling that one. I don't, you know, I think a, 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 when you look at how much fuel is consumed by what mode of transportation, whether it's four-wheelers or uh, Outboards or snow machines, outboards, they go a long way. They really chew up the fuel. Uh, same thing with snow machines. But local transportation, we haven't gotten it broken down to look at what, you know, at that cost level yet to see. But things are geared for the boardwalk. Um, I'm sure that uh, electrical electric vehicles are going to fit in there. All right, let's give guys a hand.